this is a, an amazing, amazing time of the year. It is my favorite time of the year. Yeah. Uh, and it is not just because of the gifts and all that stuff, but I just love Christmas. I really do. I love uh, everything around it. I love the lights. I love the, I love the cold. I don't like the heat. Uh, but one of the things I absolutely, absolutely love the most about Christmas is that my kids get a break from school and I get a break from taking them to school. And that's a huge, huge blessing of picking them up. So, um, sometimes we forget though, you know, the real, real reason why we celebrate Christmas. I know that we as Christians, you know, we're a church, and, but we can really forget. And I don't mean forget like we don't know. There's a lot of things you know, but you forget to give importance to. Right? Like there's a lot of things you know, but you forget to give importance to. Like I know, for example, um, that I need to spend time with my wife. I know that I need to communicate more. It's not that I don't know that. How many men know you need to communicate with your wife more? Raise your hand. Yeah. All right. How many guys actually really, that you do a great job of communicating with your wife? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Janet should be asking. Asking. No, no. He probably is amazing, right? And all the men here are hating on him right now. But the truth is that we know many things. We can know things, but it doesn't mean that we give them importance, right? And so I want to kind of just not teach necessarily anything new, but remind us of why we even markers this time, you know? Like, I, I love Christmas. I really do. I love all about it. I love the lights, like I told you earlier. But, you know the real reason for Christmas, the actual purpose, the reason, reason for Christmas is sin. And that, and that sounds, sounds super, super wrong, wrong and it sounds theologically correct, correct but, I, but promise I promise you it's true. The reason why Christmas actually happened is because of sin. There would be no Christmas if we wouldn't need a savior, like if we did not need a savior, then Christ would not have had to show up in person or in the physical body. Let me put it like this. Christ was here before Christmas ever was. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And he was with God from the beginning. As a matter of fact, we were created through the word of God. We are here today because Christ was from the beginning. I don't know if you get what I'm saying, but Christ was here before Christmas. Christ was here before Christmas. Christmas didn't just bring Christ. Christ was already here. He was there from the beginning. God said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 24, he said, let us create men to our own image. Did he have multiple personality disorder? Or was there other people there with him? It's called the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He said, let us create men to our image. This is the Father speaking to the Son, the Holy Spirit involved. He moved over the face of the waters. Listen, over the first of the earth, it was chaotic. But he was there in the chaos. Christ was there before the manger. And Christ is there after the manger. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you that the purpose of the manger is the cross. The real reason for Christmas is my sin and your sin. And if we forget that, we can fall back into this, I don't want to sound super extra religious, but we can fall back into this pagan, this ridiculous idea that Christmas is about gifts, except about one gift. The Bible says to us, a son is born, a child is given. Did you know that he was given to us? What do you mean? Yeah, he was given to you by the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. How did he give it? Through Christmas. Why did he give it? Because of your sin. Because of my sin. If we forget why Christmas happens, we can very easily fall into the same problem that most of our country lands into. And it's a consuming Christmas. A, a Christmas where, believe it or not, 45% of, uh, of first responders, they literally say this is the worst time of the year for them. Why? Because neurosis spikes. People are anxious. People become extra sad. They, they are extra aware of what they don't have. 
People get into debt that they didn't get into before. Credit cards are maxed out. You're like, I didn't come for that, Pastor. I came for a Christmas message. But I'm telling you, it's the truth. If you don't realize why Christmas is here, you may fall into the same category of people that say, I don't like Christmas. As a matter of fact, I hate. I'm not going to sound like the Grinch. But a lot of people are like, why would I receive a bunch of people I don't want to even see throughout the year and feed them food out of my own? I, I would never say that because I love my family. But some people really dislike this time of the year. Maybe some people begin to compare themselves with somebody else and what they have and what they don't have and what they can buy and what they cannot buy. Maybe Christmas becomes a time of just a reminder of the people that you lost because they're no longer there to celebrate with you. Am I making sense? Christmas can become a very difficult time. And if you're like me and you enjoy Christmas, don't forget that the reason why we're enjoying Christmas is because a Savior was given. Let me put it like this. There's four chapters in the scripture that actually talk about Christmas. I don't know if you know, but not all the gospels talk about, G about, the, about Christmas. They all talk about Jesus. It's about Jesus, life and teachings of Jesus, the gospels. But only two of those really actually talk about his birth. They talk about how he came and this, this amazing, miraculous conception. But I want to tell you that every one of these chapters, they talk about salvation. They don't come and talk to you about a tree. They don't talk to you about all these other gifts. They barely mention a lot of the things that we look at and celebrate and so much look forward to the rest of the year. But they all talk about salvation. Are you guys okay? Are you guys with me? Yeah? I promise you, even if it's heavy, it's a good message. Give God a round of applause if you understand where I'm going. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 12, it says, In the same region there were some shepherds staying. Luke chapter 2, 8 through 12. Out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Ain't that cool? Don't worry about it. I got great news of great joy, which will be for all people. For who? For me. For you. For all people. It doesn't mean just for those that are in church. It means for all people. As a matter of fact, it's for rich, for poor, for tall, for short. It's for every person, every nation. It says, I got great news for everyone. I have great news for men, for women. I have great news. It says, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior. A Savior, amen. A Savior. The question is, why would you need a savior? I read one time that if our greatest need had been education, God would have sent us a teacher. If our greatest need had been entertainment, God would have sent us an, enter sent us an entertainer. If our greatest need had been health, God would have sent us a doctor. But our greatest need is salvation. So he sent us his son. He sent us a savior. Our greatest need is what? Salvation. So Jesus was sent as a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Verse 12, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. Laying in a manger. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 121. Matthew chapter 121. And, shall, and, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin. The name Jesus, for those of you that may or may not know, Jesus, right? The name Jesus is actually, the actual meaning of it is God saves or the Lord saves. So every time you say Jesus, you're actually proclaiming the reason why he came to this world. You know, many times names uh, have no meaning. They just, oh, I like the way it sounds. But a lot of the times, especially in the scripture, people had a name and the name depicted their purpose, depicted their reason for existence. At least their parents believed that that name would imprint, that that name would be something that they would always have upon them. That if somebody was to be called, I don't know, uh, Jacob, for example, it meant something. And his name would then become Israel. Well, that meant something too. Jesus, when he saw, say Peter, his name was Simon. He knew that Simon was... A certain way and so he said you know from now on you're gonna be called Peter and he changed his name for a reason God declared the name of Jesus who gave Jesus his name do you remember who gave him his name in my house and I have a deal 
If it's a girl, you can name them. If it's a guy, I get to name them. Well, I got three boys, and you know what? I'm doing just fine with that. I don't know how you decide who's going to name them. How, Georgie, how did you decide, since you communicate so well with your wife, how do you decide who, uh, who names the child? Exactly like that? Is that true, Janet? Hey, that's, pretty, hey, that's a pretty good thing. All right, but you're losing, though. You're two to one. Okay, now, actually, you're winning because, well, is there more on the way? Ah, Janet. All right, talk to us. Okay, cool, cool. So communicate, Georgie, okay? But how do you decide? Guess what? In this one, it was a, it was a unilateral decision. Mama got no say in it. Like, mama didn't get to say, you know, I kind of like the name Jose. Like, Joe is the dad, or so I'm going to call him. No, no, actually, dad got to decide. Father in heaven, he said, no, you're going to name him this name. God decided what his name would be. Now, listen, this is so important because if you miss it, you can miss Christmas altogether. And you can make it all about the lights, the gifts, and all the environment that it brings, the malls. And, man, the malls, it's crazy, the malls. You can make it all about that and about Amazon and Black Friday. And if you missed it, there's still another chance because Cyber Monday. And if you miss Cyber Monday, there's still a deal somewhere out there for you to catch. And if you miss it, you can miss Christmas altogether. If you miss the point, you can miss Christ in Christmas. How do you miss Christ in Christmas? Christ is the reason. Amen. I, Christmas without Christ is just terrible. It's exactly what many Americans express. A time of sadness, a time of remembering what you don't have, a time of getting into debt, a time of being underappreciated, a time where what you give is never enough, a time where you thought so much of a gift and they will just return it, a time or where they gave you a gift card and they should have thought about it a little bit more. It's a time where it didn't fit, so I'm not going to wear it. It's a time where you get to keep it and give it next year. It's a time where the bag had somebody else's name on it and you got offended because they couldn't buy you a bag. Amen? Or, oh man, this is the truth. If you forget what Christmas is about, of who invited you, who showed up, who didn't show up, who decided to go with their side of the family instead of this side of the family. Amen? Did they do, did they do the leftover turkey? Did they have ham? I like ribs in Christmas. You can really forget. <laughs> somebody got excited. You can really forget. I mean, really forget. Why you're joyous in this season? Why are you to be extremely happy? Why it is that the birthday boy is giving you a gift? Isn't that strange? Like, shouldn't we be giving the birthday boy every gift? And yet the birthday boy is the one giving you the gift. If you missed the reason for Christmas, I'm reminded of a story that I try to tell as often as I possibly can. I read of this, 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 this crazy sad story. A true story, a, a mom and a dad were celebrating their, their, their baby's birth. People came to visit the baby from all over, all, all from out of town. And they were so excited. Everybody wanted to see this newborn child. Everybody wanted to see this, this, this beautiful baby. Well, the parents were still kind of gearing up. They didn't have a crib quite yet. So they put it like many of us have done in the bed and put a couple of pillows around next to the bed just in case that the baby can't really roll over, but just to feel sure. And so as guests kept on coming in, somebody decided that all the coats in the house would be just thrown on top of the bed, one after the other. And all the people that came to visit this beautiful child ended up smothering the child and killing the baby with all these coats that would continue to land on top of this baby's face. The parents didn't realize what was happening, but they were actually smothering the baby. All those that came to see him forgot about the baby, the baby sleeping in the bedroom. And you think, what a terrible story to tell, Pastor. It is not a terrible story because it's exactly what happens to us many times in Christmas. We all come and we are excited about family and we are all so pumped about what's happening and we forget that we're smothering Christ among all these other things. Again, I'm not against it. I'm not against gifts. I'm not against the trees. I love the lights I told you. But I've got to tell you, you cannot smother the child. You cannot forget that Christ is the only reason why we celebrate Christmas. He is the main reason. He's the reason why Tokyo has traffic during this season. He's the reason why Los Angeles is in traffic. He's the reason why New York. Am I making sense throughout the world? This peasant boy from the Middle East, without internet, without social media, he changed our world. He causes traffic 2,000 plus years later. Still this little Middle Eastern child, this little peasant boy. Do you understand that? Am I making sense that this little baby 
Without all the communication we have today, without the fanfare, he changed our nature. And every time you say your age, every time you tell me what year you were born, I was born in 1981 after Christ. Before Christ, after Christ, B.C., A.D., Año Domini, which is the year of the Lord. So every time we declare what year you were born, you're saying this year the world changed. This year something happened. What happened? Salvation came to the world. We knew that, but somehow we begin to forget. We can become so busy, so prideful that we forget that we needed salvation more than anything in our world. More than anything in our lives. Every one of us has problems. There are two types of people in this world. Those that have problems and those that have no problems. And those that don't think have problems have a big problem. We all have problems. The biggest problem of our life is sin. Can I describe to you what sin really is? I know that we all understand and maybe if you grew up in church you know that sin is missing the mark. Let me put it a little bit more simple. Sin is spelled S. I N S I N the I is in the middle whenever you sin you're putting yourself in the middle instead of God instead of your family instead of your wife instead of your children instead of the future every time you sin whether it is I mean, the other day I was at uh, anyway I'm not gonna talk about oh, I want to talk about it but I heard these men I was I was preparing a message for a wedding and I was sitting here and there was some men sitting around and there was a lady there too and I could have sworn I heard like like high school kids competing to see who was the baddest and the, like the biggest potty mouth and oh yeah, the toughest. When I turn around, and these are grown men that I believe, I know their wife only gave them two hours to come back home. And they were just like competing to be who was the baddest bone. And I was like, what in the world? Like, and I realized something so crazy. Like it was so wild to me. It is just about us. Sin has nothing to do with bad words or, 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 or sexuality or all these. It's just me. When you sin, you put you in the middle. You try to be something, do something, appeal to something. You try to please who? You. Nobody ever sins thinking, I can't wait to bless my family. And if you do, I promise you, I promise you this. Every time you have sinned, ask yourself. I mean a real sin. I mean like when you've done, a, you've done something that you're ashamed of. You realize I put myself in the middle. It is I who I seek to please. Sin is simply taking God out of the throne and saying, I will make the choices from here on out. Maybe your sin is not that sin anymore because God saved you. But maybe you've gone back and said, you know what, God, no, you're not enthroned, I am. I make the choices, you don't. I choose my Monday, my Tuesday, Wednesday, my Thursday, my Friday, my Sunday. I will choose how I will manage my life. I am in the middle. Every time my brother and I would get in a fight, and it would be often, my mom would always ask us the same question. Who is sitting at the throne of your life? Man, did I hate that question. Oh my goodness, I would be so mad. Because I'd be like, mm! and something inside of me, the one in the throne would say, shh. But I knew exactly who I had dethroned, even at the age of 10. Now at the age of 42, I know when I'm dethroning Christ and sitting on the throne and saying, no, no, you're not God. I'm making the choices. And if you ask yourself, I mean, a genuine question, real question, do you need a Savior? Did you need a Savior? If you say, perhaps, that you already know, if you already know, should Christmas not be the most incredible, really the most wonderful time of the year? Should Christmas not be like literally the absolute most exhilarating reminder that He came to save you? There was two people in the Bible, I don't have time to read the verses, you can look them up later. One, his name is Simeon. Simeon is an old man, a man waiting to die, literally. And the reason he hasn't died yet, it expresses it there, is because he hasn't yet seen the face of Jesus. This man believed the promise. He was waiting for the promise of God. In Luke chapter 2, 28, 30, I'm only going to read 30. He says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He holds this baby. It's the baby dedication. Eight years, eight days after the birth of Christ, he's being presented to be dedicated presented to the Lord and he has this beautiful baby and he doesn't say like, okay by the way if you know Latino families I'm going to translate something right now if it's an ugly baby and if they're honest they will not say ah oh, que lindo they say oh está curiosito <laughs> I kid you not I am like wow we are savages they will not say he's beautiful say, oh he's curious 
Like curious, like spikes my curiosity. What is that under his face? And they're under his nose. Like, what is going on? Like, but this is, <laughs> I, it's so crazy. I, 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 have you guys, okay, you've never thought it maybe, but I have. I'm like, eh, it's not that cute. Like, he, just, he was just born. Like, when my baby was born, one of them, especially, especially looked like he had beat with a bag of nickels. Like, he looked like he had been jumped into a, by a bunch of cholos. Like, this kid, looked he got, he went through the ringer. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And my mom, <laughs> anyway, you hear older ladies say, oh, ya se va a componer. Like, he's going to get better. He's going to look better. You're like, wow, should I be mad or should I be encouraged? But this is Simeon holding baby Jesus. Listen, I've never in my life heard somebody, never, never heard somebody say, oh, now I can die for my eyes have seen salvation. No one has ever said that about any one of your children, no matter how cute they are. He says, now I can die. Even my mom would not say it over my children. Now I can die. But Simeon, this old man, wise man, he says, now I'm done. Like, I, I can die a happy man now. For my eyes have seen salvation. This is what Christmas is about. Simeon knew it. A little bit further in the story, you find this lady, 84-year-old Anna. Anna was a prophetess, a woman of God. A woman who's also seen many things and waited for many years on the promises of God. And this is exactly what she says. Luke 2, 36, 38. And then there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advised, uh, advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow, meaning her husband died seven years after she, uh, after she was married, to the age of 84. Listen, she never left the temple. You think you go to church a lot. Serving night and day with fasting and prayer. This lady knew what's up. At that time, that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of Him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This lady knew who she had seen. She sees the baby. She's like, the redemption of Jerusalem. This is salvation. Redemption, if you don't know, means to buy back. When you lose something and you purchase it back like in a pawn shop, you can't get, perhaps you got to pay rent, you go, you take some jewelry, and you finally gather enough to get your ring back, to get whatever you get back, you're redeeming that. You lost it, you had it there, there's a ransom to pay, and you redeem it. This is Anna saying, we were lost. We belong to God, but we were lost through sin, and now we have a path to redemption. His name is Jesus. This old lady said, and I wonder why two old people. I wonder why it doesn't say, and a teenager came along and said, now I can die. My eyes have seen the Savior. It is so incredible how much we can learn from people who have been to places where we're barely walking into. It is so much, so crazy how little we value the advice until later on we realize, oh my gosh, she was right. Like he was right. The Bible does this on purpose, tells us about two experienced, godly people who had been walking, seeking God's face. These were not just people that kind of randomly liked and cute baby around. No, these were people that knew the Lord and were seeking for God's face. And they tell you, these wise people, they say to you, I know something you don't and I can recognize it when I see it. And this is a savior. This is the greatest gift you will ever receive. These old people have something to teach us. Don't you think that they will say this is redemption? Don't miss Christmas. I have about five more points. I'm only going to give you two more. Is that okay? We okay? One simple point. I remember a few years back I was translating for Pastor Jorge. He was preaching a message. And he was talking about Christ. It was a Christmas message. And I love translating for him. Um, not only because he's my father-in-law, but because he's a man who loves the Lord. Like, he loves Jesus. And he said something that pierced my heart, and I did not forget it. I wrote it down, and I kept on mulling over it. And he just really blessed me, and he continues to bless me. And he talked about how Christ... I'll take you to the verse. Are you guys good? Okay. He talked about how, um, in Luke chapter 2, verse 6 through 7, another part where it mentions the story of Christ. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. Her who? Mary, good job. And she gave birth to her first son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
we see a manger today, and we're like, oh, <laughs> it's a manger. A manger is like the dog bowl. You know where you feed your dog, where you feed your cat? It's just a big one. It's where the animals would eat. It's where they would put the hay so that the cows would come and graze on it. Your Jesus, my Jesus, was born where animals feed. Let me put it like this. The Savior of the world, the universe creator, the being that's a, just, the Bible says that he literally spoke you and I, everything we know, into existence. That God holds everything in the palm of his hands. The God that many, 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 many smarter people than I and you, perhaps, have been trying to explain away and yet cannot. How many people today in this room would look forward for you to have your child be born not in the Methodist hospital, but in the manger? Why did he have to be born in such humble conditions? Why did he have to be born in a dark course now we see the lights we see the the beautiful setting and we're like oh it's so cool but where does the light come from have you ever been in a stable before led lighting by the way have you ever been in a place like that and the the, the kind of cold that is so bitter that it hurts your bones the god of course we see it little animals creating like mini split air conditioning like heating around them no no, this is Jesus being born in the bitter cold, in a dark and dirty place. Why did he have to be born in a manger? The Bible says he had to be born there because there was no room for him in the inn. And it just baffles my mind that today, the rejection of Christ before he was born, we just kind of overlook it like, oh, there was no room for him. Christ was rejected not only by his people, Christ experienced rejection before he was ever even born. The Bible says that Joe or Joseph, he tried to divorce Mary before he even saw him. Like before the wedding was actually taking place, the seven days, he said, you know what? I'm going to leave this girl. And I don't blame him. He's a teenager guy. His girlfriend comes and says, hey, Joe, I'm pregnant. Don't worry. It's an angel. Oh, really? His name is Angel? You know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? You're pregnant? This doesn't make sense. We have, can't happen. No, it's of God's. It's of God's. And he's like, why are you talking? No, I'm leaving you. Could you imagine that conversation? Could you imagine the rejection that Christ, from the very beginning, experienced from the womb? I don't want to spend time with this, but neuropsychologists explain this away very easily. How a rejection could be felt from the womb, from the time that a mother says, I would rather have an abortion, the child's already perceiving and receiving this. Now, you may not think so, but do you think a skin cover, like a blanket of skin, can protect a child from all bad feelings, from all screaming, from all anger, from all sadness? I got to tell you that Christ experienced rejection from the time before he was born. There was no room for him. There was no room for him in this world. People rejected him. His own disciples left him. His friends betrayed him. Kings, everybody turned against him. At some point, his siblings, by the way, he had siblings. They called him crazy. Are you nuts? Come home. Get out of there. And he said to, he said to them, who is my family? But those that do the will of my father. Jesus constantly getting rejected. Why? And the answer is simply sitting on your seat. So you could be accepted. Christ was rejected. There was no room for him to make room for you in heaven. Why did Christ come to be born in a manger? Can I finish with this simple story? Max Lucado is a guy that's blessed my life so much. Eoni and I love this, this pastor. He's uh, discipled our children. He doesn't even know it, but we do devotionals every day with our kids based on, on some of his books. If you, if you have children, I recommend a book called, uh, uh, what's it called, Love? Every Day? <laughs> Undescribable. Indescribable. So, Indescribable series, yeah? By Max Lucado. Uh, and he said something so cool. Let me, let me just read it so I don't butcher it. It says, Max Lucado said this way. The tongue that called forth the dead was a human one. The hand that touched the leper had dirt, dirt under his nails. The feet upon which the woman wept were calloused and dirty. And his tears, oh, don't miss the tears. They came from a heart as broken as yours or mine have ever been. So people came to him 
My, how they came to him. They came at night. They touched him as he walked down the street. They followed him around the sea. They invited him into their homes and placed their children at his feet. There were those who mocked him, who were envious of him, who misunderstood him. And there were those who revered him. But there was not one person who considered him too holy, too divine, or too celestial to touch. There was not one person who was reluctant to approach him for fear of being rejected. Remember that. Remember that when you see the nativity scene with a helpless infant drawing shepherd and wise man, manger, beast, and celestial angel, all in an unearthening atmosphere that was not to mark his entire life. Listen, even when that life was eventually slain on a desolate hill in Judah, remember, for man seems always to build barriers between himself and God, but Jesus builds bridges. Christ came not to be revered. He was already God. He came to build a bridge, a bridge through a cross, a bridge through suffering, a bridge through his blood. He was rejected so that we can be accepted. In the end of his life on earth, he says, Abba, Abba, Laba, Sabachthani, Father, Father, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? And I think the answer to that question is here today. I can't count the numbers, but that answer is here. For me, for you, so we can actually celebrate with our family. Celebrate what? Yes, togetherness, but you can be together with people without the tree. What do we celebrate if not the Savior, if not the Christ? You know, Christ is still born in mangers today. Cold, dark, and dirty places, such as your heart and my heart. A place where it's cold, because we don't have the fire of God. Dark, because we don't have the light of the world. Dirty, I don't need to explain that one. If you lived more than 10 years in this world, God is still willing to be born in cold, dark, and dirty places. Aren't you glad a Savior was given? Aren't you glad a son is born? Aren't you glad that God gave us the gift of salvation? I want to ask you to stand for a second and to acknowledge something very simple. I always try my very, very best I'm not always successful at this, but to give my kids what they really want for Christmas. Now, like I said, I'm not going to give them something that I know is going to hurt them. But I found something really interesting, really funny, because now they have grown a little bit more, and now they are making money. Now I mean like they're making loads of money. I mean like they make money, and they save it. So Josie will always tell you, I'm a baller. And he shows you his wallet. He's like, I got $137, Dad. I'm like, dude, you got a lot of money. He's like, I know. <laughs> and everywhere we go, and then Elijah, by the way, everything Kosi has is because Elijah has given it to him from his own money. And so they give each other gifts. So yesterday, two days, was it yesterday? They only took them to Target to buy gifts for Christmas for each other. So then they went at it, and I wasn't supposed to be there with Elijah. It only was supposed to be with Kosi, and I was supposed to be there with Elijah. And so I don't know how they found a way to the toy place, and they found each other. And they ended up buying for each other a gift with their own money. It just so happens they both wanted the same kind of gift. And so they bought each other Christmas gifts. And I thought that was super cool. I was like, man, these kids are buying each other Christmas gifts. I don't have to. I'm just kidding now. No, like I have to too. I have to put my own part. But, but it was so cool because, you know, they brought out their Christmas gifts. And it was supposed to be a surprise. Of course, it isn't a surprise because this morning, uh, well, because they were there buying it with each other. But this morning I wake up and I'm like, they were up early today. Like early. These brothers were already, they were Lego gifts, okay? Like Lego Mario, where it's like, they have Bluetooth now. Do you know Legos have Bluetooth now? Yeah, I know. That's why I was like, the world is coming to an end for sure. Like Christ is coming back. <laughs> the mark of the beast, look at it. Nah. No, it's like, you have Luigi and Mario and you bring them together and they're like, hey, and they're like, recognize each other. I'm like, what is going on? These kids have been playing for, I don't know how long with their Christmas gift. They were like already all involved in it. They played for hours with each other. I'm like, dude, it's not Christmas, bro. I was about to get mad. I was like, hey, mom's going to get mad. <laughs> You're supposed to open them in Christmas. They're like, no, dad. This is our gift to each other. I was like, that's deep right there. <laughs> You're talking about, <laughs> hold on. He's like, this is our gift. And I was like, 
yeah, it is kind of your gift, I guess. I couldn't get mad. I was like, I know there's something wrong with it. I don't know how to, I don't know what. And I went back in the room. I was like, should I tell Eoni or should I not? And they just, they, 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 and I'm thinking, I'm not kidding. I'm like, these kids have done something that most Christians don't do. I know you think, pastor, you always make everything into an, 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 like an analogy. I know, I'm sorry. My family is a sermon prop sometimes. <laughs> but listen, God gives you the greatest gift of all. Like the greatest gift. This is by far better than anything. As a matter of fact, King David, I'll talk about that next week. Forget King David for now. Let's talk about him next week. But God gives you the greatest gift. Like the most incredible gift you could ever receive. You cannot buy it. You cannot get it on your own. God gives you salvation. Dude, that's, that's better than anything you could ever get. Salvation. Salvation from your sins and salvation for himself. Listen, salvation is not just fire insurance. It's not just I'm not going to go to hell anymore. Woof. It's not like that. Salvation is God, you have saved me, not just from, but for. For a purpose, for you, for your love, for your grace, for your peace. Am I making sense? Like you have saved me that I would do amazing things while I walk on this earth because you and I have a great commission. Amen. I don't know if you go what I'm saying, but some people just want to be saved from something. Uh-uh. I want to be saved for something as well. Amen. Amen. Give God a round of applause if you understand what I'm saying. So now that you're saved, here's the problem though. Here's the, here's the problem. A lot of people, uh, they have a gift. They receive a gift. Some people just straight reject it because they have no room in their inn. Hope you caught that. And if that's you, the innkeeper had no idea who was in the womb. But you do. And so to reject Christ, it may feel like I'm pushing you into something. And I push people into terrible things before. My friends and I, bro, just suck them, bro, just suck them. Oh, you're going to let them do that? You're going to let them say that? How many of you push somebody else into anger, into sadness? If I can push you a little closer to the Savior, I will. By any means necessary. But if you keep rejecting Christ as though he was just some other option, some other alternative, let it not be because you were not told or warned that God loves you. He came, he died for you, and he's waiting for you with his arms nailed wide open. Today, that is the truth. Right here, right now, it's your choice to say, there's room. I'll make space. I don't know how. I don't know how, but I will, God. I need you. I want you in my life. But here's the thing. A lot of people have salvation, but they don't do what my kids did. It's called appropriation. Oh, it's so different. One thing is to receive. Another thing is to unwrap it, enjoy it, make it yours, love it. Am I making sense of people? Oh, I'm saved. Well, why do you live as though you were going to hell? Like, why are you living like sad? Like, I get it. She didn't like you back. But you're saved. I know that sounds really like trivial. But let's take it a little bit further. I'm losing my job. But you're not losing your salvation. Am I making sense? Like, thank God. I don't understand when my mother experienced the death of my father, whom she loves so much and still loves. I don't understand what got that woman through with three kids at Mexico City. 17 days later, out back serving in the field, she told me something. She said, you know what? I knew I would see your father again. I'm like, it wasn't like, I'll see him one day. I mean, like, I know I'll see him again. You know what that is? Is the assurance of salvation. It's saying, I know that the end, I'm not going to put a period where God puts a comma. Am I making sense? This is me saying, God, I believe that I've been saved. Therefore, what can man do to me? This is why Paul said, oh, death, where is thou sting? This is why a person who's going through Christmas and the missing of loved ones, they can say, God, I know that because of you, I have a chance, a greater chance. Guys, may you never experience another Christmas without the assurance. Today, I want to encourage you to do something. And you're saying, man, this sermon's taking a left turn real quick. No, it isn't. It's taking the right turn. I promise you that. Don't go one more Christmas. Not one more nativity scene, not one more gift without realizing why it actually is. Let salvation come to your house. Let salvation flood the hearts of your children, of your mom, of your dad. Take opportunities like Christmas to say, I love giving gifts. Here's a gift for you. But can I just share two minutes that God loves you? And I know I messed up a lot. I'm not the best example at times. But Christ came to this world. No historian will ever, ever, there's no historian worth its salt would ever say, that Christ didn't come to the world. There's more documentation about this man than any other historical figure in the entire world. You know that? Did you know that? Whether they like him or not, he is. The question is, do you reject or do you accept him?
Middle ground is always rejection. I just did a wedding yesterday. It was so cool. And I wonder what would have happened if while I ask, Michael, do you take Leslie to be your beloved wife, to have and to hold? And Michael's quiet. I said, Michael, do you take Leslie? And Mike's just like, mm -hmm. what would you guys say? Dude, what would her dad say? What would she say? How long have you been quiet? How long have you been silent about Christ? I know it's polarizing, but it has to be sometimes. I want to do something. I want to close your eyes. Would you please close your eyes for a second so you're not thinking of everybody else and everybody else? There was no more room for Jesus. There was no more room for Jesus. Dear God, would you forgive us if we choke out the message of Christmas, the real message of salvation? Dear God, I ask you right now that you would help us to understand, to go back to the simple thought that for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God, today we go back to you. Today, God, if there's anybody in this place that pushed you out of their lives, maybe you're here today at church because somebody invited you or you're here at church, you haven't been in a long time, you have not been serving God, you want to restore your relationship with God. You want to say, God, I, I will make room for you in my life. Forgive me, God, if I've allowed so much to get in the way. Some of you, perhaps, have been filling it with service or religion. But it's not that. It's Him. It's Him. The reason you serve is because of Him. The reason we do what we do is because we love Him because of communion with Him. You cannot replace Him for the service of Him. It's seeking Him. It's seeking the face, not the hand. It's seeking God's heart, not just the product. I invite you right now to return to the Lord, to say, God, I'm sorry if I pushed you out of the inn, if I pushed you out of my heart, if I pushed you out of my life. God, if I got too busy in my mornings and my nights, God, today I come back to you. I ask you to forgive me, Lord, to change. Help me change, Lord. I want to prioritize you. I want you to be the Lord and Savior, not just the Savior. I want you to be the Lord of my life. God, I want you to take the front seat. I want you to take the driver's seat, God. I don't want you, Lord, to be the spare tire in my life anymore. I want you to be the wheel, God. I want you, God, to lead my life. If there's somebody here, perhaps, that has never given their life to Christ, I want to do something very special today. I want to ask you to take a step of faith and I would love to pray with you. I remember doing this when I was in, still a young man. I was very young and I knew what I was doing. I knew exactly what I was doing. A pastor named Marco Barrientos asked who wants to give their life to Christ, surrender their life to Jesus. And then he said the following words, which are in the scripture. Those who confess me before men, I will receive, I will accept before the Father. But those who reject me, I will reject them also and I remember thinking God I don't want to reject you I want you to be my Lord I want you to be my Savior and I want the world to know yes even my older brother if you're here today and you want to surrender your life to Christ because you realize you need the greatest gift and that is salvation if you've never done this before I want to invite you to come to the front and I would love to pray this prayer with you that today there will be an AD and a BC that today will be an after Christ and a before Christ in your life We'll wait for you in the front and I would love to pray with you. The rest will just continue to pray and ask God to help them to restore relationship. Maybe you've been walking well with God. Help them to help you. Ask them to help you remember. Ask them to help you drive and, and go closer and go closer to Him. Is there somebody here that wants to give their life to Christ? Is there anybody here that wants to surrender? Come to the front. Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. God bless you, brother. What an amazing choice you're making. Receive the gift of salvation. Beautiful stuff. God bless you, man. God bless you. You're amazing. Is there anybody else? I will wait.
God, I ask you right now, if there's somebody here that realizes that they need you or there's something holding them back, if it's sadness or pride, Everybody keep your eyes closed. I'm going to pray for those that are coming to the front. The difference The difference between guilt and shame is that guilt comes when you know you've done something bad. Shame comes when you feel you have become bad. And I want to tell you that Christ has come to wipe away your shame and your guilt. To wipe away the weight of sin. He went to the cross to pay for your sin. And today he tells you that he loves you. And that he's here just for you. If you came to the front, let's pray. Tell him, Jesus Christ, I surrender my life. I ask you today that you forgive me, God. Change my heart. Make me the person that you want me to be. Tell them, forgive my sins, God. All my sins. I give them all to you. Thank you for dying on the cross in my place. Would you give me eternal life? Thank you for resurrecting, not just dying. Because you have defeated death. And I have victory in every area of my life. Dear God, I want to walk with you. And I want to know you more every day. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Give God a big round of applause. close your eyes and lift up your hands dear God we worship you we praise your name would you allow this season to become a time of worship in our house God would you engulf our house that we will be reminded that our sons and daughters God will know that there is a savior in our home that more than gifts and more than a tree and more than lights you are there you are present God we declare that you are enthroned in our families you are enthroned in our homes we love you, Lord, so much. We thank you for what you've done. How could we ever not praise you after all you've done for us? Thank you, Jesus, for coming to this world and saving us. We love you, Jesus. Christ came to this world and in the last 24 hours before he went to the cross he spent time with the disciples and he decided to have one more meal which is something that we know as the Last Supper in the Catholic Church you may know it as communion or here as well There's this moment where Jesus says, I've been looking forward to this time with you. How I yearn to do this one more time with you. Jesus would be celebrating something called the Passover feast. He said something very powerful. He said, this do in remembrance of me. 
every time you do this remember me and the church sometimes does this and they don't realize why Jesus said that Jesus was remembering a moment where the people of Israel were enslaved for 400 years they would suffer 400 years they would suffer at the hands of the Egyptians they would pray for a deliverer they would pray for deliverance the Lord sent somebody named Moses Moses through the mighty hand of God through the power of God and after a certain amount of trouble and plagues the Lord set the people free and the way it happened is the last plague or the last thing that happened is that the angel of death would come and take the firstborn child of every home now listen this is important the Jewish people celebrate this once a year for eight days a specific moment and they remember this Passover they celebrate Passover the word Passover literally comes from this that the angel of death would pass over the house what house the house that would have the blood of a lamb by the father by the priest of the home sprinkled in the dindles of the home this father this priest would sacrifice a lamb and use the blood and would signify I am under covenant I am under this covenant which is the blood and so when Christ comes and has passed over with his disciples he does something so beautiful he's not saying this is so beautiful remember me this is me the new covenant this is my blood for you when you take this remember my blood is your new Passover my blood is for you you will not experience eternal death you will have eternal life because I the priest the high priest the Lamb of God I have given to you something which before could never be attained and it is the new covenant through the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ Christ came to fulfill that law that requirement that moment and he told his disciples listen you are now free to live you now receive the greatest gift of salvation we celebrate communion not because it's a religious ritual not because we have to we celebrate communion because we remember the sacrifice of Christ we remember the Passover lamb which is Christ we remember that he has given us salvation forever that it is through his blood that we now have freedom from sin amen so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take the bread and remembering the very words of Christ that this is my body that is broken for you this too in remembrance of me you may eat the bread God for your body thank you Lord so much then he took the cup and he shared it with his disciples and he said to them word by word this is my blood which is shed for the remission or for the payment of your sins this do in remembrance of me you may drink Thank you Jesus so much for the gift of salvation thank you Jesus because it is not by rituals that we are saved because it is by your grace and by your love thank you God for everything you've done if you do nothing else you have already done so much for us God we love you so much we love you we are yours we love you Jesus in your name we pray amen amen give God a big round of applause amen